E. They still have to choose medicines, food, housing, heat, all these things. And so they have the choice in how are they going to handle it. Treatment options. What are the cost of the treatments? And what kind of help? Do, th do they have to pay for help to come in to help them? Or will they have to be there by themselves? And that is a huge angst for some individuals, for many individuals. Family. Is the family going to be there? Or does the family have their own, own health issues? We see many individuals who come in and um, <clears throat> the caregiver may be the one that ended up with an emergency appendectomy. And they're caring for a spouse who has Parkinsonism. So who's going to take care of the person with Parkinsonism? While this person is in the hospital, even for 24, 48 hours after a laparoscopic appendectomy, but they're not supposed to be doing any lifting, they're not supposed to be doing anything to help with this Parkinson, and they can't drive for a certain length of time. So again, that's part of the suffering that this person may be going through. Uh, community is very important in helping with handling some of these sufferings, but they also be part of it because the person may be an active member of the church, but they may become sick, and they don't go to church, and they feel that they're forgotten. Or I've driven around to churches, and it's not so true now, but in the past, there's no way for somebody who was handicapped to get into many churches. Now most of them have ramps. Many of them have ramps. I don't know if all of them do. But I know that in the past, you couldn't get into a church if you were wheelchair-bound. Again, that's part of the suffering. So... Again, cultural inherited factors adding to, and you can imagine your brain about some of the things that are added to them. The isolation that these people feel. And many people feel that if they have cancer that it might be contagious. You know, when we have, work in offices and all of a sudden all the women are pregnant, young women are pregnant. They're right, oh, it must be contagious, it's in the water. But, you know, people in, the, in times past they felt that if somebody had cancer, they couldn't go out because it was contagious. We know that that's not the case. However, these people, the elderly, were raised at that time, and so they may be thinking of that. When you are ill, you don't think at your own age level. You're thinking as a young person. When you're faced with a trauma or faced with something, you're not, I'm not thinking as a physician. I'm not thinking as a person who is older. Um, I'm thinking as a young person probably 10 to 15 years old is my reaction, my brain and emotional reaction. So when you're talking with somebody, remember that you're dealing with that level and you have to be speaking carefully at that level. So and people with pain don't really want to travel because to get in and out of a car, to sit in a car, to sit in a plane, to try to get there, and what kind of things are available to them when they get there, so they're isolated. Even to go out to a club meeting, to go out to lunch, to try to do that, and if they're having severe headaches, how are they going to be able to handle that? Are they going to be able to take their medicine? Can they handle the noise factor? Can they handle all of that? So that is, again, part of this one. Spiritual. Um, what makes life worth living for you? What is important for you? What, makes, what is, um, brings you joy? Those are the part of the spiritual things. Spiritual is not going to church. Spiritual is inner. It is inside you. What makes you a person? And that is very important when somebody is having to, as I say, having to dig deep to handle a severe chronic pain. Somebody with or a severe chronic illness. Again, somebody with bad lungs who is suffering because they can't get enough air. What allows them, what makes them continue on? Why do people stay alive when they have some of these things, and why don't they die? We don't know. Why do they recover from a major car accident and continue to live? I don't know. That's part of their, who they are inside. And part of the spiritual thing is also the isolation that some people feel, that nobody understands them, nobody knows who they are. Again, that can be part of some of that suffering related to a pain or related to a chronic illness. Again, some of the physical sufferings, again, the dermatological, the dry skin and some of these other things, or they don't look like they used to. People are on medications, people are on steroids, and all of a sudden their face changes. They get the cushionite appearance, they get the puffy cheeks. That's not who they are. And so people don't recognize them. 
they've lost weight because of a cancer, then people don't know who they are. You know, hair color, that's something, you know, that we can change that. Hairstyles we can change. But those things. Incontinence is one of the things, ways that people suffer. Um, women, I think, are just sort of going, oh, yeah, I'm going to have incontinence. I had some babies. I'm getting older. It's just part of aging. Men don't think that way. <laughs> Men don't like incontinence. We're talking about urinary incontinence. Bowel incontinence is a whole other thing. That is huge suffering. If you've seen a person where they first, they've ever had incontinence of stool, they are, they're very upset about it. You know, if you, you know, if you watch them, they may try to cover it up, but if you look at them carefully, you notice they are very upset about that, no matter what the reason is. They don't like it. It's one thing we learned at a very young age. We're supposed to control our bowels. Bladder, you know, we just sort of, well, maybe I'm generalizing here, but as a woman, but, you know, women are incontinent with many different things. <laughs> Neurological problems. You know, that's uh, suffering. Again, we're talking about the, the headaches, the other things that happen with the um, suffering that comes from a headache, you know, where you can't stand the, the lights, you can't stand the noise, you can't stand all those things. That's not a physical thing, but it's a suffering thing where, you, again, you can't go out. If you're in a migraine, how many people have you seen in the middle of a migraine or personally felt them and you, and you have to go into a quiet, dark room, which means you're missing the whole family gathering. You're missing everything else that's going on. And, you know, if you're one of those people who likes to be in the middle of everything or bossing everybody around, like I do, <laughs> so you have to, you know, you're going to be missing, you're going to be in trouble with that. Okay, the tr weakness is a huge way of suffering. If you are used to getting up and going for, you know, I'm going to be extreme, a 20-mile hike or a five-mile run, let alone a marathon, and now you have a problem where you're weak and you can't do that, that is going to cause huge emotional suffering for you because that's not who you are. It's not who you, your goals in life. Again, the, pul the shortness of breath, the pulmonary edema, the people with heart failure, people with lung disease who can't breathe and they're gasping for air. There's nothing, there's no physical pain with that. Well, they may have some tissue pain from the anoxia or some headache and some other things, but that is huge suffering that these people are going through. Okay. How do we treat suffering? We can use medications. Um, you know, we can, oxygen is a medication. We can use that for helping with some of the shortness of breath. We can use other ones for, anxi for their anxiety. We can treat the pain. We can treat, you know, the pruritus. We can treat some of these things. But mostly it's just the presence. And when you're dealing with somebody, somebody this is the eye contact. This is the white way of doing it. Many Native Americans don't like eye contact, and other cultures don't, eye con don't like eye contact. So you need to understand who you're dealing with when you're doing that. Respond to the patient's affect. You know, you just say, if they're, you know, they're in tears or they are looking withdrawn or whatever, you know, you can come in positive thinking, but you need to be able to respond to them and handle them that way. Demonstrate empathy. There's different ways of doing that. Um, and a patient-centered interview. Nursing staff know how to do this. Physicians have never learned. So, but you need to, you know, you know how to talk with them about who they are, what's important for them, and how to do that. That's how you're trained. That's what, that makes a nurse. And so, um, but, you know, you want to understand where they're coming from, not giving them a lecture on what medicines you need and what the lab work is and all these other things that the physicians are t taught to do. But, again, allowing them to be part of it and, treat and helping them. Again, other supports would be family, cultures, uh, their group, their support group, and different agencies that might be available for them. Okay. The first thing is to maximize dignity and quality of life when we're treating pain and suffering, and that is open-ended. You can do whatever you want to do. That Your imagination is the limiting factor. You look at the patient's goals, their values, and their preference with regard to treatment, which means you have to talk with them. You have to understand where they're coming from, where the family is coming from, and provide patient, uh, comfort and support for the patient and the family. Remember, you're not dealing with an individual. 
there are a few people that we see who are alone in life. There are some street people who have nobody, but they may have some friends out there that we don't know about. And then you become their circle as you're taking care of them. You become their circle. The patient's priority of seeking health care may be from different locations. They're not getting it from one person. They're going to go somewhere else. They're going to go somewhere else. And so it also will include your complementary and alternative medicine. And so you may not even know. If you're working in one place, you may not even know what else they're doing because they may not tell you. And if you think about your own experience, you know, you're saying, okay, I have this and I want this for it. You know, you're, a, you're adults. You're trained. You know what you have. You have the medical background. You know what you need. But if you're not going to get it, how many of you then have gone over to somebody else? And they haven't listened to you, so you've gone over to somebody else. <laughs> so, and, we're, and, and so that is part of it because you, want, you know what you need and you know how to, you're trying to get what you feel that you might be needing. So, and it requires honest communication, and that is the hardest part because sometimes um, you, just, you, know, you try to fluff it. You don't want to be really negative. You don't want to um, make a person feel bad. But when a person is sick... I think most people want the, they want the truth. And it's just like when you have to tell somebody that somebody has died. You have to, they, when you call them on the phone, they know something terrible has happened. And so the first thing you say, the way I was taught, was that you say, this person is better, there's no problem, there's no crisis, because they're holding their breath until they hear it. And so you say, this person, you know, their loved one is doing fine. Or your loved one has died. And then you go through and spend five to ten minutes on the phone with them. You've all been through this, or many of you have been through this. And so you know, you just don't... And so, again, it's the honest communication of working with them about what is necessary, what could be used, and what should not... what could be done, what couldn't be done, about what there is there. The advanced directive is very important for this. How many people here have their living will done Okay. If you're over 18, you should actually have one. This is a plug. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you don't have one and you get sick, your spouse is responsible for saying what they think that you would want. If you don't have a spouse, it's a committee. How do committees get things done? Poorly. But So you need to have an advanced directive and have somebody labeled who's going to be your health care, your medical power of attorney, who can speak for you if you cannot speak for yourself. Somebody who knows your values, who knows what you want, who knows that this is, what I, this is how I want my pain control. If I'm in pain, I want it treated. I may not want to be able to talk to somebody. I want my pain under control. Okay? So you need to have that spelled out so people understand on what your goal of treatment is. And so, again, it may include your medication to control pain. It may include, um, in Montana now we have the POLST form, which is the Provider Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. That is not an advanced directive. It does not say, make, say who is your medical power of attorney. You need to have one of those that, who can speak for you. So this is an important document to have. You can get them online from the state. Almost every agency has, has a copy of things that you can use. But again, it's important that the people understand how you want it to be treated, and that's the main thing, so that you have a voice when you have an illness and people understand so what you would want. And hmm. so and all aspects of life have some pain and suffering, whether no matter what it is. So we as caregivers of a loved one or somebody else and providers of health care need to identify that and offer a treatment plan so that we can help them so that they don't feel that they're, in, they're isolated, that they're alone, and that we can help with them and make sure it's something that is acceptable to the patient and to their family. Okay? And that is all of my slides, so we're open for questions, comments. Uh-huh. Okay, I think this is wonderful. 